Perched atop the misty shores of the island of Great Britain, Scotland stands as a land cloaked in intrigue and mystique, capturing the global imagination with its captivating landscapes and rich history. To the culturally uninitiated, it's a land that conjures images of the dramatic tales of Macbeth, the enduring legacy of the Highlander, the delightful sing-song of its unique accents, and the peculiar allure of black pudding. Yet buried within this collage of cultural and historical marvels, one family has decoded the mysteries that Scotland so coyly guards, the Dukes of Bucklew. It's a lineage whose name resonates through the corridors of Scottish history with as much familiarity as the skirl of bagpipes across the Highlands, and holds sway over vast tracts of land, presiding over an estate encompassing an astounding 280,000 acres. With a dominion reflecting over five centuries of accrued power and prestige, this noble family has been part of the British aristocracy for many generations, with their multi-million pound wealth and significant political influence consistently sending shockwaves through Britain's historical epochs. In this episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll share their full story with you, from this clan's bucolic highland peaks to the family's sultry political intrigue, as we describe the wealthy British family that owns Scotland. In the lush rolling hills of Scotland, Richard Scott, the 10th Duke of Bucklew, holds court as a leading figure among the nation's landowners. His real estate portfolio, expansive enough to turn the heads of seasoned tycoons, reportedly spans an impressive 200,000 acres. Rumors, however, hint at even larger numbers, with estimates reaching up to 270,700 acres, spanning the picturesque terrains of Scotland and England. And nestled within these bucolic expanses are some of Great Britain's most historic estates. Bow Hill House and Drumlanrig Castle are prime examples, shining as crown jewels in the Duke's property empire. Bow Hill, shining stone beacon of art and history, houses an art collection that could rival many established galleries, with works by Canaletto and Gainsborough. Drum Lanrig, on the other hand, has welcomed a diverse array of guests from Bonnie Prince Charlie to Queen Victoria, though the family hasn't resided there since the early 20th century. A peek into the Duke's finances reveals a net worth hovering around £3.5 million. Yet, as it goes in aristocratic circles, this figure might just be scratching the surface. Some speculate his worth to be closer to £175 million, and that's not even accounting for his extensive land holdings. But the Duke's wealth is not solely land-based. He oversees an art collection that includes a da Vinci, valued at an impressive £150 million. Additionally, he chairs the Bucklew Group, involved in ventures ranging from real estate to gastronomy. Yet, despite his vast holdings, the Duke is not known for hoarding his wealth. In a move that defied aristocratic norms, he once contemplated selling a 3,000-acre portion of his Queensbury estate to the residents of Wanlockhead, a quaint Scottish village. This gesture showcases that even within the aristocracy, surprises abound. And his children, instantly born into the Scottish aristocracy, were raised amidst opulence and duty. Lady Louisa Montagu Douglas Scott, born in 1982, was the first to experience the high expectations of her lineage. Her brother, Walter John Francis Montague Douglas Scott, the Earl of Dalkeith, born in 1984, was prepared to inherit the dukedom. His education likely included lessons in leadership and stewardship, and Lord Charles Montague Douglas Scott arrived in 1987. The youngest, Lady Amabel Elizabeth Gabrielle Montague Douglas Scott, and born in 1992, grew up under her elder sibling's guidance and their mother, Lady Elizabeth Kerr, was an art patron who sadly passed away in 2023 and left a profound impact, instilling a love for art and philanthropy and continuing a legacy of culture and kindness in their upbringing. Now, while it's all well and good to hear about how this celebrated clan enjoys their millions and raises up their next generation, we're sure the real question you're wondering is, how did the Bucklew family get so much power to acquire land in the first place? My apologies. But to answer your question, dear viewers, we'll have to turn back the clock a bit and envision ourselves falling into the verdant expanses of 15th century Scotland. In the Scottish borders during the 1440s, the Scots of Buccleu began to etch their name in history, not just through lineage, but through strategic land acquisition. This journey started in the year 1116 in Peeblesha and saw them expand from Ettrick to Eskdale, showcasing their medieval real estate acumen. 
More than just landowners, the Scots were castle builders. They erected keeps like Newark and Akewood, and grand fortresses such as Hermitage. Branksholme stood as their power base, a symbol of dominance and a testament to their deep roots in Scottish soil. Next, the 16th century spotlighted Sir Walter Scott, knighted in 1590 and famed as Bold Bucklew, and his audacious rescue of Kinmont Willie from Carlisle was a clear signal of the Scots' rising power and influence. The emergence of the specific Bucklew name in 1552 marked an era of honour, especially after wicked Watt Scots' valour at the Battle of Pinky Clough in 1547. The ennoblement of his great-grandson as Lord Scott of Bucklew in 1606 was a nod to the family's ascendancy. And it was during this time that their acquisition of the Bucklew estates laid the groundwork for their future status as one of Scotland's largest landowners. Now, in 1606, Sir Walter Scott, the first Baron of Bucklew, exemplified vision and leadership. His great-grandson, the second Baron, soon became the first Earl of Bucklew in 1619, further elevating the family's social standing and securing a legacy of land and influence. Then, in the 17th century, the family began to engage in the classic old money playbook of strategic intermarriage, first by having James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, and Earl of Bucklew marry Anne Scott, the fourth Countess of Bucklew. Indeed, this union was a strategic consolidation of land and power, contributing to the Scots' status as major landowners in modern Scotland. Next, the year 1684 saw the union of the Scots and the Douglases, another prominent family. This marriage was an additional strategic merger, further solidifying the Scots' land holdings and influence. By 1745, during the Jacobite uprisings, the Scots, now allied with the Douglases, played a significant role, and their actions during this period were not just about the present, they were shaping their future as key players in Scotland's landowning elite, stepping into the role of substantial landowners recognised today. As the 19th century drew to a close, the Bucklew family, then storied guardians of vast Scottish lands since the days of Sir Richard Le Scott, stood on the brink of an unforeseen challenge. Their centuries-old legacy, built on power and land, faced a critical test in the looming 20th century, a legal battle over inheritance tax valuation. This impending conflict, set to finally unfold in the 1960s, promised to shape the future of one of Scotland's most influential families, casting a shadow of uncertainty over their historic legacy. The story begins in 1812 when Charles William Henry Montague Scott, Earl of Dulkeith, ascended the grand stage as the fourth Duke of Bucklew and sixth Duke of Queensbury. This wasn't merely a title change, it was a pivotal moment in the family's storied history. A man of many hats, Charles juggled his roles as a Tory politician and an amateur cricketer with a flair that was nothing short of regal. His rise to dukedom in January 1812 was swiftly followed by a knighthood in the Order of the Thistle, a nod to the Bucklew's esteemed position in Scottish society. Fast forward to 1875, and the Bucklew estate found itself at the heart of a seismic shift in land ownership norms, mirroring the societal and economic transformations of the era. But the Dukes of Bucklew, ever the astute navigators, leveraged their significant land holdings to enhance both their influence and economic standing. As we venture into the early 20th century, the Bucklew family's land empire spanned several estates, including the aforementioned Queensbury, Langholm, Bow Hill and Borton, with additional land near Dulkeith Palace in Edinburgh. At this juncture, the sixth Duke, William Henry Walter Montague Douglas Scott, made his mark as a member of Parliament for Midlothian. His political journey, however, hit a bump in 1880 with a rather unique pamphlet titled The Political Achievements of the Earl of Dalkeith, a publication featuring 32 blank pages that led to his electoral defeat against William Gladstone. The Sixth Duke's untimely demise in 1914, at the onset of World War I, brought Walter John Montague Douglas Scott to the fore as the Seventh Duke. Thus, this period, marked by two world wars and significant socio-political upheaval, saw the Duke juggling mining interests and estate management amidst economic challenges. Now, the interwar years were characterized by a House of Commons dominated by the plurocratic elite, a trend the Bucklew Sons were part of. And the Great Depression of the 1930s wasn't kind to the Dukes either. The Eighth Duke, Walter Montague Douglas Scott, faced his share of challenges including political controversies. 
notably his meeting with the German ambassador Joachim von Ribbentrop, which stirred significant speculation about his political leanings. Post-World War II, the 1950s offered a canvas for recovery and growth. The Duke, known for his liberal views, notably supported the admission of Hong Kong Chinese in 1988 and opposed the feared privatization of the Forestry Commission in 1993. Business-wise, the Duke's management of the Furness estate continued, with the family's business correspondence included in the Henry Robinson loose papers. Yet, as the 20th century drew to a close, the storied Bucklew family found itself entangled in a web of legal disputes that would stretch into the new millennium. At the heart of this intrigue was the will of Walter Francis John Montague Douglas Scott, the Duke known for his sprawling estates and considerable wealth. The contentious details of his will sparked a series of protracted legal battles, with one of the most dramatic revolving around a £4.25 million claim for the recovery of a stolen Leonardo da Vinci masterpiece. This legal labyrinth, involving claims and counterclaims, set the stage for the 21st century, brimming with controversies that would challenge the Bucklew legacy like never before. In the bustling early years of the third millennium, the ninth Duke of Bucklew, with an air of environmental sagacity, tried to embark on a journey of eco-consciousness, a path carved out by the teachings of Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. Here, the Duke imbibed the wisdom of blending environmental policy with economic pragmatism, a cocktail of ideas that didn't always sit well with the traditionalist environmentalists. His stance, stirring a pot of controversy, highlighted the delicate dance between economic viability and conservation. The year 2010 would bring the Countess of Bucklew, the family's art protector-in-chief, center stage. With a collection that would make even the most stoic art aficionado's heart flutter, think Rembrandt and Holbein, the Countess faced the Herculean task of art repatriation. This quest was ignited by the dramatic theft of da Vinci's The Madonna with the Yarn Winder from Drumlanrig Castle. The painting's odyssey, from theft to recovery, underscored the vulnerability and significance of safeguarding cultural treasures. And the Countess's efforts dovetailed with a global movement to restore art to its rightful owners, a quest mired in legal labyrinths and diplomatic tightropes. Luckily for them, her commitment to ethical art ownership not only put the Bucklew name in a positive light, but also underscored the complex politics of art repatriation. Meanwhile, in 2012, the 10th Duke faced an economic conundrum. To fend off the jaws of hefty tax liabilities, he made a landmark decision, selling off vast tracts of land and an array of art and rare books. This was more than a financial transaction. It was a recalibration of the family's legacy in response to the economic pressures of the day. Two years later, the Duke steered the family ship towards the shores of renewable energy. This venture, a significant pivot from tradition, marked the family's embrace of sustainable practices. Engaging in renewable energy projects, the Duke showcased an alignment with more modern environmental causes, thereby driving local economic development and supporting community infrastructure. Roll over to 2018, and the 10th Duke found himself at the heart of a land reform storm in Scotland. Despite his initial resistance, he began downsizing his land holdings, a move seen as a potential boon for land reform. However, this decision was not without its controversies. Lady Charlotte Bucklew uncovered family archives that cast new light on her lineage. These treasures revealed intimate details about the family's historical significance and their societal roles, offering a fresh perspective on the Bucklew legacy. The archives unraveled stories about Charlotte Montague Douglas Scott, Duchess of Bucklew and a confidant of Queen Victoria, and Walter Montague Douglas Scott, the fifth Duke, whose intriguing anecdote about a mysterious black box and a royal lineage claim added a touch of historical drama. Now, in a move that might remind one of a strategic chess game, Richard Montague Douglas Scott, the 10th Duke of Bucklew, has continued to weave a narrative of stewardship and innovation in the 2020s. The Duke notably set a course towards a more sustainable and diverse business model with the sale of Langholm Moor land to oxygen conservation, marking a significant step in this direction, blending environmental progress with community benefits. The artistic sphere too has felt the Duke's influence. Borton House, a jewel in the family's crown, buzzes with creative energy, hosting an array of artistic endeavors under his patronage. 
Parallel to the Duke's environmental and cultural strides, Elizabeth Marion Frances Montague Douglas Scott, the Countess of Buccleuch, carved out her niche in the realms of art and culture. Her leadership roles spanned prestigious institutions, from the Scottish Ballet to the British Museum. Her brainchild, the young Walter Scott Prize, stands as an emblem of her commitment during her life to nurturing historical exploration and literary talent in young minds. And the Countess's patronage of the Royal Caledonian Ball, a whirlwind of fundraising and reeling, has aligned with her broader dedication to charitable and cultural causes. Meanwhile, her influence permeated the Bucklew Collection, one of the globe's most enviable private art troves, boasting masterpieces from El Greco to Gainsborough, to which she added contemporary flair. The current Earl of Dalkeith, another Bucklew scion, brings a modern twist to estate management. Balancing commercial savvy with social and moral considerations, his approach has garnered acclaim, especially in harmonizing forestry and agriculture. As the horizon of a new era looms, the Bucklew legacy, a complex interplay of politics, business, and intellectual advancement, awaits its next chapter. Despite owning so much land that it could make God reconsider his actions in the Book of Genesis, the Bucklew family has attempted to steer their holdings with a distinct sense of noblesse oblige. If they have succeeded in accomplishing that goal, is up for you to decide. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. What is your opinion on old money aristocratic families like the Dukes of Bucklew owning so much land? Is it a good or a bad thing? Thanks again for watching us, and cheers. Until next time.